when I was a fresh-faced 18-year-old college student. I worked at a fast food restaurant near a truck stop. I had just moved from a relatively small town of around 3,000 to a city of around 65,000. That's not even including the college students. Somehow, I was not familiar with creepy men just yet. So it's my second or third week, and I'm on cashier duty and it's very busy during dinner time. Everything is going fine, and I'm doing pretty well because I'm a relatively friendly person, while still making sure the line went smoothly. A lot of truckers come in, and a relatively heavy set gentleman with a typical trucker outfit, you know the one, jean jacket, dirty jeans, so much denim, is next to me at my register. I put his age around 45, and smells like the worst body odor ever. He orders, and I tell him it will just be a few minutes. I look behind him, indicating that it's time to move on because I'm going to help the next person behind him. And this is when it starts. You look pretty young to be working. <laughs> yeah, this is my first college job. No, no way you're in college. You're just a baby. I spurt out some more awkward laughing and then address the person behind him. The man still didn't move. You look tired. Yeah, I've had a long day of classes. I'm tired too. Want to take a nap with me in my truck bed? Yeah, okay, moving on. I readdress the person behind him and even move a little to the side so the customer can see me. Luckily, his food comes up and then he disappears finally. It was a good thing too because he was making me very uncomfortable. My manager, who saw the whole thing, started asking if I knew that guy and if he was bothering me. I told him that I didn't know him, but he's gone now so it's not a big deal. I figured that would be that. Boy, was I wrong. We start the process to close up around 10 p.m., but we actually close at 11. I'm doing some light cleaning, and we get someone at the drive-thru. I have a headset, as well as my manager, and one other person does as well. So right now, it's just us three there for the night, because our store was famous for being understaffed. My manager took the order, and does the standard greeting. Then we heard that familiar voice of that trucker from earlier. What time is the cashier girl done? My manager turns to me, completely frozen and not sure what to say. My manager turned the headset off and asked again if I knew this guy. I tell him no. And then my manager immediately goes into attack mode. I'm sorry, sir. We have many females on registers throughout the night, and I am not allowed to give out... The babyface girl. I know she's still in there. I told her I would give her a ride. I cannot give out that information. Tell her I'll be waiting. He then drove off. My manager immediately runs in the back and leaves me with the grill cook standing there, confused and scared. Fifteen minutes later, the general manager comes in and asks me some various questions, such as if I'm sure I don't know this man, and then told us to shut the lobby down and just keep the drive through open. They go in the back room and shut the door. At around 10.45, the grill cook, who came up to talk to me as I was visibly shaken, noticed an unmarked police car sitting in our parking lot. At 10.55, my manager comes back out and tells us to just shut the store down. Finally, around 11.45, we're finished, and I grab my coat from the break room. Normally, just myself and the grill cook would walk out together, but instead, this time both the manager and general manager walked both of us out. Sure as hell, there is a truck with its lights off, waiting outside of the normal parking lot in the truck stop and instead is in our parking lot, as if no one would notice the big huge truck. As we make our way to our cars, the trucker turns his lights on and starts his engine. And immediately after that, the undercover policeman that was in his car got out and walked each of us to our individual cars. That trucker must have seen the cop and the manager as well as the general manager and just immediately drove off. Although nothing happened, our policy on our store changed with the closers and how they could leave the store. Now we had to go in in packs of threes and could not leave until everyone's cars were started and their lights were on. Again, nothing did happen this night, but I'm terrified to think about what would have happened had that policeman not been there as well as my managers. In 2003, 
I had met a guy that said he would take me on an adventure and make my life exciting. Little did I know that the safe world that I'd grown up in was about to get shattered. Myself, I lived in a small town, and I'd never really traveled outside of my state. I'd never experienced life in other ways that others would. We were kind of sheltered from the big crime and other things that had been happening all over the countryside. So, my boyfriend, now ex, decided to take me on a journey of being an on-the-road truck driver. In a lot of cases, this was a great experience, and there was a lot of fun times, and I got to see most of the United States. But trucking life is hard, and being on the road 24-7 isn't exactly easy. Being cooped up in a small truck with someone for that long will cause anyone to become a little mad. Life on the road is much different now than it was when I was trucking. People now have advancement in technology and the ability to binge watch your favorite YouTube channel, surf the web, or play games on your phone to keep yourself preoccupied. The only forms of entertainment we had was either watching one of the dozen or so DVDs, reading yet another book, or talking on the radio. We often opted to talk on the radio, and this became our version of social media long before Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter was even a thought. Just like we do now, we created a different identity or persona to hide behind while interacting with people who are basically strangers. And trust me, truckers can be creepy as hell. Keeping a bit of anonymity is the only way to stay safe on the road. When you're a trucker, most of the time you'll acquire a CB handle. My ex's was Ninja Dwarf, and me just being a baby only 20 years old from Alaska, mine ended up being Northern Exposure. During the time on the road, you meet a lot of crazy people and you see a ton of crazy shit. And I do mean a ton of crazy shit. People often hear about stories of things happening on the road. And most of them are gross and very scary. But this time, it was one of the most terrifying experiences I've had in my life. And when it comes to strange and unusual events, my life is full of them. Have you ever gotten the heebie-jeebies from someone's voice? Like flat out scared to talk to someone? A voice that makes you think that the person on the other line is not all there? That was this guy. Something about him just made my skin crawl, and I've only heard his voice through the crackle of a CB radio. One day, the CB started to crackle and we heard a distant call. We could barely hear a voice through the static, but eventually he got close enough that we could hear him clearly. He must have been 50 miles or so behind us because it was still faint, but our CB radio was peaked and tweaked and could really reach out and touch someone so we could hear him through the chatter of the CB. It's just so hard to explain, his voice, but the best way to describe it now would be like Heath Ledger talks as the Joker in the Batman movie. There's just something off about it, you know, and it gave me the chills. He simply said, Hey there, Purple Pete, which was the color of our truck. Where are you headed? My ex hollered back that we are heading to Arkansas. The driver said he was going the same way and asked if he could tag along with us then introduced himself as Maniac. We would run from one coast to the other and then back again. The guy always seemed to be running the same route as us, but we had never actually physically seen his truck. He described it as a 378 long-nosed Peterbilt. It was black and had a brow and cattle guard. According to him, he ran dry box from California to Florida, which explained why he always seemed to be either coming or going on the I-10. One week, we were running from Florida back to Louisiana. We caught up with him on his back trip from Redmond, Washington to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He told us that he would meet up with us in Nevada when we did our trip back because by that time, we would have run out of hours and need to take a rest. We said sure, even though I totally didn't want to meet this guy in person. But my ex had become friends with him, so we gave him an ETA on when we would be back in the area and what truck stop we would be at and told him we would meet up for a meal. This was really before the idea of having a cell phone for anything other than emergencies, so it wasn't like we could just call him when we were gonna be in the area. Anyways, he agreed and we parted ways. My ex continued talking to him until the radios would no longer reach. We had finished our load and were heading back to Las Vegas to the truck stop we had agreed upon, and then waited. Las Vegas is a shady place for truckers in general, Lots of crime and bad stuff happens, so we waited inside the truck. Finally, we got bored and ventured into the truck stop for a bit. We continued to wait, and wait, and eventually killed enough time to where we could take another load, so we headed back out, never actually meeting up with him in Nevada. 
but a few months later, we ran into him in Oklahoma. We had heard some chatter on the radio about these lot lizards getting brutally murdered at truck stops all over in Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Tennessee. I chalked it up to drama on the radio. After all, we had quite literally nothing better to do than to make up truck driver stories. We kept hearing about it over and over, and once even brought it up to Maniac. He just laughed and said it must be one real sick f doing it. It must be just a story, because if it was true, they would have caught him already. I bet he's even left fingerprints or semen at the crime. With as bloody and messy as it was, I bet he wants to get caught. It seemed like a weird thing to say, but also, he was a very weird guy, so that was totally in character for him. Maniac went his way, and we went ours. And after a while, I forgot about that weird comment. Fast forward to a few weeks later and we were in Mississippi. We heard a familiar voice on the radio. We had taken a long weekend because it was Labor Day and most companies were okay with drivers taking an extra day off. Our plan was to make it to this lake out in the middle of nowhere and we were going to drop off our trailer and head out Bobtail. So we chatted and he said he was heading to Tennessee and that he would be heading out next morning. And so, cutting our much needed break short and by passing the weekend at the lake, my ex decided to run with him so that there was someone to talk to. We had gotten into an argument earlier, so I wasn't really talking to him at the moment, but he absolutely hated the silent treatment. Our load was to deliver in North Carolina in a few days, and being a few hours ahead of the deadline just meant that we would be at the top of the line to pick up our load back. Win-win. So we headed out that morning, and the guys decided we would stop in Tennessee and finally, after six months of chatting back and forth, meet one another in person. We weren't afraid to meet up with him, but I was still very on edge. Now, I was no slouch. I grew up with 15 boys in a house that was a known fighter. My ex was a pretty big dude, standing 6 foot 3 and about 280. So in theory, we could take him if we need to. The only way he'd get the best of us was if he had a weapon, which back then was highly illegal to have in the trucks. And if you were caught by Dot, it was jail time, no questions asked. With our company, we had a very specific fuel stations that we could use to top off. Maniac was an owner operator, so he could go anywhere. He said that he already stopped to get fuel and took a shower, but he would drop his trailer off and meet us at a Flying J petrol station. It was down the road from where he was, which I believe was a Love's fuel station. So we get ready to fuel up, we both showered, and got a booth at the restaurant. We waited about 45 minutes before ordering some food, and again, waited and waited. No one ever showed up, and again there was no way to contact him. My ex personally was not a patient man, so we ate our food and then headed back to our truck. I remember it being dark and humid, it was probably 10pm or so. There wasn't much for noise in this truck stop, which was kind of unnerving. A quiet truck stop is a creepy truck stop. We walked across the fuel island to be greeted to a shit ton of flashing lights. It's not uncommon for either lizards to get busted or drivers to get involved in shit they're not supposed to. So in the moment we really didn't think much of it. Cops and a truck stop go hand in hand. But this was more than your typical truck stop shenanigan. We passed 12 trucks or so. It was one of the bigger flying J's so it could probably fit about 80 trucks and trailers if you went all the way back to the dirt. And then you could tetris a dozen or so trucks in the lot dirt that happened to be where our truck was. Now I'm a curvy girl. I'm not fat, but I don't look like I belong in a truck stop. I was used to drivers looking at me all creepy like. I always got taunted and harassed for being a lot lizard, even though I was a driver. In fact, there are some truck stops that are not safe to walk in alone. I was walking with my ex and we weren't holding hands or anything, but it was obvious that I was with him. We walked down the row and saw a bobtail truck parked in a full parking spot. I thought it was weird that he was in a truck space with no trailer. Typically bobtail trucks will park at the end of a run and leave the big spaces for trucks with trailers because that was again another unspoken rule. We moved by that truck. It was a dark truck, maybe a dark black or blue, with a cattle guard and a brow. Don't remember seeing what type of truck it was other than that it was menacing just sitting there in the dark. The old school trucker code was, if you were looking for company, the driver would park and leave his reading red lights on to tell the lot lizard that the driver was looking for entertainment. The guy was sitting in the passenger seat. 
He had the red reading light on, so I could see his face. It was a little distorted, but he definitely gave me the creepiest smile and then quickly shut his blinds. We were about six trucks down from that bobtail. I could see his truck from ours and I remember looking back and seeing that red light still illuminating the porthole window in the passenger door and a small slit down the curtain showed a dark spot. He was still watching us. Even with as warm as it was, chills shot up my spine and I got a very uneasy feeling. My gut wrenched with a sudden feeling of dread. We finally got back to our truck and turned on the CB for our night entertainment and to see if we could radio maniac to see what the deal was. The chatter was all about police, the ambulance and fire trucks, as well as Dot. All the commotion was basically across from us, but two rows up. People were saying that there was a dead lot lizard and that it was really bad, like gnarly bad. One driver started to explain it, but then was told that he had to keep his mouth shut by a police officer. Being the nosy people that we were, my ex and I jump out of the truck to go investigate. We dodged in and out of the trucks and managed to wiggle our way up to the scene. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, some things cannot be unseen. This was definitely one of those. The lady, well, what was left of her, had been tied to the trailer in the truck, and then someone pulled the kingpin, the piece that locks the two together, and let down the landing gear. The driver, who was now sitting in the back of a police car, his head hung limp with his forehead on the back of the seat. He was crying big heavy sobs and there was vomit on his shirt. We could hear them through the closed doors, wailing that he had nothing to do with it and praying to God to be forgiven for what he had done. The poor driver had obviously not done a safety check before he left and just decided to pull out of his space while she was fucking attached to it. She got ripped apart, right in half. Without getting too graphic, I can tell you that a normal human body should never look like that. It was like something you would probably see in one of the Saw movies. I remember stumbling back and bumping into another driver. He just looked at me, pale, and looked as if he was going to get sick as well. I don't do well with that body function, so I quickly moved away from him and started making my way back to the truck. I was damn near running back. Zero fucks given that I should have waited for my ex because he had the keys. I made it to the truck and tugged on the door, but it wouldn't open. So I ran back to the truck stop at full speed. I was going to get sick, and I would rather not have people see me. I passed the spot where that bobtail truck was, and it was gone. My ex made it to the truck stop looking for me, and he said that he would walk me back to the truck so I could get some sleep. Like I was going to get any sleep after seeing that. He turned on the radio and began to talk to some other drivers. No one had seen anything. There hadn't even been much lizard traffic. The police had been working overtime cleaning up the truck stops after they'd caught wind of the first few murders. I sat in the bunk and just stared out of the windshield at flashing lights. And there was a tap on the door. A police officer said he was getting statements from everyone that was in the truck stop. Giving us the rundown about safety and numbers and not to go anywhere alone. I wasn't planning on leaving the truck. I told him about the creepy guy that smiled at me in the bobtail truck and the description of it. I could tell the officer didn't really see the point of me telling him about this creepy guy, but he took down the information anyway. I really don't think I slept for days after that. I just kept seeing that image. Flashes going through my head. The vivid and visceral image of her face. She had a rag in her mouth, and the 100 mile per hour tape around her wrist tying her to the headache rack. She had obviously struggled because there were bruises formed on her stomach and her face, and there was mascara running down her cheeks. The smell. Oh, the smell. It's like rotted meat and blood. Makes my stomach queasy just thinking about it now. It didn't seem to phase my ex. He went on like it wasn't anything big or special. After a few weeks, I finally managed to get the image out of my head. Or I'd finally convinced myself that it wasn't real. It's just a scene from a horror movie. Either way, I was just glad to have it out of my head. Fast forward, it was now February. Three months after that incident, and we were headed to New Orleans. I was super excited to see the area, and hopefully to get in to see Mardi Gras. I wanted to visit the cemeteries and see the mausoleums and maybe go to a voodoo shop or something. We had a few extra hours to spend there, so I was really happy when my ex said that we could go wandering around a bit. We parked at this little truck stop. It was more of a mom and pop type of shop with a small dirt lot and a flickering light pole on one end. But it was within walking distance of the French Quarter, which is where I wanted to go. Hey there, Purple Beat. What brings you out this way? 
The voice on the CB was loud, so he was really, really close. There was only two other trucks in the lot, an old freight liner hauling a swift trailer and a dark green Kenworth that had a cattle car on the back hauling cows. My ex was still a bit miffed about being stood up months ago. He really could hold a grudge when he wanted to. Maniac, hey man, where the hell have you been? Why'd you stand us up there, good buddy? My ex radioed back. Oh man, you know how it is. Cops make me a bit uneasy, and I'd rather not get fucking caught. He said with a chuckle. Caught? What do you mean caught? My ex questioned. Don't worry about it. Just keep an eye on your girl. I'd really hate for something bad to happen to her. Like all those other girls. He trailed off. We watched the CB key up again, burying the needle on the radio. The signal was so high that it had to be in the same truck stop to ping that high. Silence. He was keyed up, but just kind of breathing into the mic. You know, with all the bad things I've been doing in these truck stops, I like to play with the lizards before I torture them, and then destroy them. <laughs> Those nasty sl- They shouldn't be defiling themselves with drugs and sex like they do. It sounded like he was talking through gritted teeth. More silence. His voice was even louder this time. We could hear the rumble of a truck heading down the one-way street that ended at the truck stop. Only God and the devil himself can judge me for my sins. I will continue to rid this world of diseased ones that plague humanity. We looked at each other this time. This was the only time I'd ever seen anything like fear in my ex's eyes. Tears began to well up, and for the first time, I was truly scared. A dust cloud came rolling up into the back of the truck stop. This dark black menacing Peterbilt with cattle guard and a brow came rolling by slowly. The driver keyed up as he passed the nose of our truck. It was that same creepy guy from the truck stop months ago. He smiled that disgusting smile at us as he put the mic to his lips. Safe out there, Ninja Dwarf, Northern Exposure. His CB handle was pinstriped on his driver door. Maniac, in bright red letters. In April of 2004, we headed back to Alaska because my ex's father had a massive heart attack. We stayed there for a while before heading back on the road. As far as I know, there were seven total murders. There could have been more. Who knows how long he'd actually been ridding the world of its sins. And I honestly don't know if the guy was ever caught. I can tell you one thing though. The second time around, I wasn't making friends with anyone on the road, and from then on out, I kept a six-inch blade on me at all times, just in case I ever ran into Maniac.